Hello, my friends. How are you guys doing today? I'm a little tired. I've been doing long sessions the last few days. But excited to get on here and chat a little bit more about business. We'll get John on here in a second. How are you guys doing? What's up, everybody? Hello. Alexander, how you doing, man? Yeah, there were so many questions last week from... Um, from the, the topic of the music business that we kind of did an overview last week and maybe we'll go, thanks Terrence, maybe we'll go um, into some more specific questions this week. Um, hopefully John get on here in a second and uh, so me. Um, yeah, there were a lot of really specific questions about points and fees and I think we'll go into some of those. We'll see kind of what, um, what John's feeling. Um, but yeah, hopefully it was useful last week. I know we kind of talked philosophically about how to think about managers and how to build team members. We really talked a lot about uh, our arc uh, for these sorts of things. Um, I don't know where John is. I can maybe start. Oh, there it is. Uh, start getting into some of these questions. Waiting for him. John. What's up, man? Hello. Whoa, you look fancy. Really? I like it so much, man. Thanks. You, you look like you look like a, a super fashionable guy from the future and from like the 1500s and maybe a cult leader. I really like it. <laughs> Let's keep cult leader out of the possibilities. <laughs> You're a benevolent, benevolent leader. How are you I'm doing? Starting, man? I'm starting a mix cult. It's going to be a bunch of mix engineers. Maybe I'll wear a suit. I'll wear a suit next week. Uh, it was just cold outside when I went uh, to get coffee this morning, and I just, you know, whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, this, the sun is shining here in Malibu, but it was real cold last night. I'm trying to jump into the season change because it happened so late for us yeah. here in Los Angeles. So I like wore my long coat yesterday and today. I'm ready to go. Jumping in. It's a great, it's a great vibe. So how you doing, man? How's the last week been? Obviously, it's been politically, it's been crazy. I know we don't really talk about that stuff here. Have you yeah. been working? What do you, uh, what have you been, um, been working like crazy? It's honestly not the best week, but that's for an off-camera discussion. Okay. Um, okay. This, uh, this, the, it is a very busy week though. I mixed six songs, five songs yesterday, and wow. and one this morning already. So. It was a long day. I'm kind of breaking all my rules that I talk about on this show with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which, <clears throat> I saw which you post I, about that. I took no breaks yesterday except for to eat this uh, olive oil cake that was left over um, good that a friend a break. brought me. Um, and I just ate it out of the baking thing, which for those of you that don't know me, I'm mostly on a ketogenic diet. So the sugar is not my thing. So I crashed really hard. Uh, by mix five i wanted to get six done but i got really crazy sugar high and then crashed at like 9 p.m that's, but i think it was an 11 hour day with no breaks well i've uh that's that's great I, I actually really like um i really like one of the things i like about these discussions is we talk about philosophically all the things that we try to do it's important for people to not feel bad when they don't do them because yeah. we all have like like the last three days or last two days um, I had a artist friend of mine, Bobby Bracken stay over here and we mm. just did marathon sessions. We did six records, like mm. from scratch, finished records, six records in two days. And we just like stayed up super late, smoking weed, like just like just late nights, going to bed yeah. at like three in the morning and just making crazy records. It's been amazing, but I'm, I'm like off my schedule too. And not taking, I'm not taking breaks and doing like yeah. a nice measured thing. I mean, I'm getting up and doing a little meditation in the morning. That yeah, sort of still thing, doing the, the morning meditation. I played tennis yesterday. I rode my bike this morning. Um, so I'm still doing like a morning thing, but a way more abridged version than right into work. Like I was read, I was at work mixing at 9 a.m. this morning. Like just good to go. I, th I think about it this way, and it sounds like you're, you're similar where, you know, we talk about these various routines, some of which we try out, some of which we stick to. Um, the, the things that I have that are consistent, some exercise, meditation, journaling, a few things like that, even when things are really crazy, there's like, there's like a maximum version that I do where I'm like always mm. taking breaks. And then there's like the condensed version, but I still do something. I still something. do stick to the routine a little bit every day. Yeah. Um, I assume you, you do something like that too. Even yeah, when I mean, really I, crazy. I never don't, I haven't not meditated in, I think it's 600 days now or something. So 
that's like that's not going to change even if it's just a quick 10 minutes like and even if it's a bad one i don't consider anything a bad meditation because it's the act of sitting that i i just want to do and I, I i give myself um pretty low pressure on that i just do it no matter what so i'm not doing the hour a day like you're doing of sitting doing nothing i do it some days um, but I'm not doing that every day. I'm doing that some days. That one is a little bit harder for me at the moment. Um, so I'll, I consider listening to a podcast as close as I can get to that, where I'm, I'm, I'm not externally looking for um, any more stimulation than what I choose to hear at that moment. Because sometimes I zone out and I just let the words come in my head. I don't even remember what they talk about, but I might remember 15% of it. And that's enough for me because it gives me the chance to zone out and not pay attention if I don't want to, but I'm not staring at my phone. I'm not working. I'm not being, um, physical. It's just like I'm sitting or I'm walking and, you know, yeah. maybe around somebody, my block. Somebody asked in the chat there, do you think it's ever, do you think it's ever good to important to break your routine? I would say if you're making the decision, yes. If you're failing mm -hmm. to do it because you can't like you're like, oh, I just don't feel like working out or I don't feel like you're not making the time for yourself. That's not the good. If you want to break routines, absolutely try different things, but do them in a deliberate fashion. Yeah. I um, mean, I really, I really need the distraction this week. So I'm making a very conscious decision to just put my head down and work all week. Um, starting the week with 11 mixes to get done this week um, with mastering deadlines like in, in a week or two. I'm just going to use that as a distraction from anything else and just put my head down and go. Sometimes um, you got to do that. Sometimes you just got to do it. And that's what music offers us. Music offers us very little friction. Um, and the opportunity to create <clears throat> is uh, an optimal distraction from certain life things. We, we talk about this sometimes. Uh, you and I have similar perspectives, although I think about it a little different. The idea of, especially earlier in your career, sometimes just putting your head down and going crazy and working a ton to to just like make progress and get in reps and get in mixes and get in songs and just do a ton of stuff. And then as we get older, kind of find the balances. Um, mm -hmm. But even when you have the balance, like you said, like I, it's, I think it's a different situation for us this last week, but both of us have like gone back into that mode a bit this week. Um, yeah. And there's something really wonderful about it and comfortable about it. And uh, it doesn't mean that, you know, you need to ultimately find the perfect Zen balance. Like the, the, the person asked in the chat, do you ever break your routines? I think it's really important to change things up, but doing it deliberately, making choices and being like, shit's yeah. crazy here. I'm going to dive into this, or I've been doing the same thing for a while. Let me switch something up and see what it feels like. The deliberate decisions I think are really important. That's how you find yeah. the best routines for yourself as well. Agreed. Agreed. So um, yeah, that's where I'm so at with that. Let's, um, we talked a lot about sort of overall stuff with business last week, and I don't know exactly where the conversation will lead us today, but I think it might be worth talking about some more specific things. Mm -hmm. Um, there were lots of very specific questions and you know, we yeah. talked generally last week about, uh, managers and how to think about business people. Um, there's, the, I don't know the best way to talk about this. So maybe we'll just start the topic. The majority of questions were about uh, you know, how do I talk about money? And we talked about it last week a little bit um, about the discomfort and it's still uncomfortable. And that's the reason ultimately to try to get a manager to get someone who does that for you. So you can focus on making records, but you do need to figure out how to have those conversations and understand it. So there's questions about fees, about points, about yeah, all when, of when, when is it appropriate to, when, when do you, uh, Larry asked, when would you ever discuss points as a mixer? getting paid royalties. Um, hmm. uh, so a few people asked about, oh, uh, Michael asked, what was your progression with fees? A steady increase or when it jumped? How do you talk to clients about raising fees? Mm -hmm. You know, and it, it's, it seems to me that uh, it's important to distinguish in, and we talked about a little last week, but the various roles, there are people who are working on, engineers that are working on day rates or hourly rates. Um, sometimes you get paid by project rate producers tend to be a little bit different where once you know you might do a lot of work with an artist for free where you're creating and then when they decide to put things out then you do a deal for the music that you're putting out yeah. for you uh, on the level you're at the sort of highest level of being a mixer you know there really isn't I, i'm sure there's a variable rate sometimes where somebody's like hey we know what your fee is, but will you do the whole album? It's twelve songs. We get a deal. I guess people do that sometimes. I, again, I don't yeah. want to. I don't want to. Yeah, you know, I'll do that. Ten, ten, but, and a, ten uh, over ten songs. I offer a deal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know. Do you? Uh, There's do you a lot of ways just, in. A lot of ways in. Do you, do you have any entry point? That I you mean, clients are just. 
I'm inclined to be on as honest as possible. I w- yeah, al- I, I, always. I, I will as well. Yeah. And I don't, I don't want to like, give TMI away, but I'm not sure that the, the value of discussing um, rates necessarily, necessarily what mine or your rates are, yeah. but yes, there's been a steady incline. Uh, and there's always room for negotiation based on certain factors. And you decide those factors yourself. You decide when to raise your rate yourself or in, um, in combination with strategy with your manager, uh, which is how, how I've raised my rate because I'm uncomfortable talking about money. I just was thinking about it this morning. It's funny that this is like this is the main question. My manager texts me this morning about um, a gig that came in that needs to be done by tomorrow and a really fast turnaround. Josh is on the computer right now prepping it, so I'm going to do it right after this. And they came in lowballing the rate. And by the end of the conversation, they were at my full rate, including a point and everything. It got there. But Nathaniel, you know, is kind of touting the fact that he got it there. And I, I that's what I need. I need him to be like, no, what are you like? Why are you lowballing John? He's he's got fucking 12 songs on his plate this week or whatever it is. And if you need this done by that, you're going to ask for a next day turnaround and a low ball. It's like so I don't know if that's his angle, but that would be my angle. If I was managing someone, you're going to ask for the hookup on this, not, Hey, I got a month turnaround, you know? So I think I'd be more flexible with lower rates and hookups for people that wanted, um, you know, no rush turnarounds. Right. So that's an example of when I'd say, okay, I can squeeze that in within a month. I understand your situation. You're paying this for out of your own pocket. Um, I still won't go below a very, uh, a certain level of, of money. Um, because I think we need to value, our experience. Uh, and I don't want to undervalue uh, people that are at my experience level as well, that I, I know a ballpark of what they're charging. So I never want to undervalue. Uh, I'd rather do it for free pro bono, which we've talked about many times that I do about two projects a year uh, pro bono. So if that's, that's the only other way, it's like full rate, just shy if there's a few um, caveats that maybe we can work out together or free. Um, and that's about it. Even when it's free, I probably will still get a point and operate in the uh, the royalty and the, the copyright. Um, now, on on that tip, this is a controversial subject matter for engineers, and we see a lot of engineer memes uh, out there talking about everybody deserves a point. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know when that's true. Um, I don't know when that's true because I wouldn't want a young engineer to not take a, a, a career defining project because he or she thought that they deserved a point and they have nothing else to stand by besides the fact that they have talent. Josh was just asking about if we're going to talk about points and he was kind of thinking the same thing. I think we should talk about where the point comes from and the point comes from the artist. So well, should, we, should we do a basic, like a, 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 a really quick, like two minute or five minute one oh one on royalties, which we will, I, I don't know all the specifics of these yeah, days and how these things work, but, but essentially when people talk about points, they're talking about percentage points out of a hundred percent of the royalty. And usually in like a standard record deal where an artist yeah. signs to a major label, they're getting between 15 and 20 percentage points yes. of that's what the, I was just going to say. Yeah. Of their money. So, so, so continue. So, so we're talking so about as an points engineer out of 100, 100%. and as a, pro, as a producer, exactly out of a hundred percent. If a producer is involved or two, the points for the producer and the engineer takes a producer point. It's an engineer point. That's a producer point comes from the artist share. So my controversy, my side of it is, yeah, I think every engineer should get a point for what they do, but I want to be compassionate and I want to be empathetic and consider that it's coming from the artist who has maybe 14 points and they've given six to so-and-so for a co-production. Maybe, you know, three is standard, three to yeah. four is standard, but yeah. some, some producers are now five point and, and you see them talking about it. They're five and point, especially six point Especially if they're producers. not getting their full, full fee. If they're not getting their full fee. Trade fee for more royalty. Right, so it's not so black and white for me to say everyone deserves a point. Yeah. Um, I think that, the, yes, the overarching, um, exactly, uh, Terrence, like people don't know that. I think that that should be changed. I think that the label is paying, well, they're advancing the artist's recording budget to the producers and engineers, and they need that to be recouped from that, from that share. But I'd argue that they could recoup the producer and engineer points from their side of the 85% that they maintain ownership, right? Like thinking about the fact that 
um, Universal uh, Records uh, went from an $8 billion company to a $33 billion company in the last decade. It's pretty insane. Um, and their artists aren't making much more than they were historically, right? So yeah. I, I don't know. Maybe maybe there's a way to change that. But for now, that's not the case. I just yeah. want to express that point of view that it, the caveat to my point that I don't think everybody deserves a point is because of this. And if it's coming from a label, I would argue that, yes, everybody deserves a point. But because of the deal and a lot of deals with artists or deals with the devil with the label, um, it's not as simple to say. That being said, at a certain level of your career, I think that you should demand it. And yeah. I think that if you're if you're affecting the copyright, if you're affecting the master in a creative way, that everyone that does that should hold a piece of that copyright. Um, so that's kind of where where my head's at. I don't know that everyone deserves it, but I know at some point everyone deserves it. Like the the difference between we talk about this in conversations a bit. The difference between um, a commodity engineer and an artisan engineer. Like a commodity engineer, someone that's in the room, making exactly the same decisions that the artist wants, do not really doing their thing. There's really no creative input versus, yo, I need so-and-so to finish this record. Like you're engaging that person for their aesthetic. Yeah. Once that, that, that to me is easy. That to me, that click is like, okay, you're engaging that person for their aesthetic, their expertise, their ability to finish, their ability to give me a higher chance of um, having success with this record sonically, um, competitively, then they're deserving of a point right off the bat. There's no argument there. Yeah. Um, so that's that's kind of where I'm at. What do you think? I, I think that's all right. Um, uh, I also want. I'm always trying to like take the step back. We're talking very specifically about the traditional tr traditional record deal, and I think that not only are there a lot of big successful projects that don't have the traditional arrangement, there's more licensing deals yep. where now uh, even big artists who've gotten through their record deal will sign a new record deal, but the terms will be very different than the first yep. one. It might be what they call a licensing deal, which is the artist owns the masters and uh, uh, owns the masters and licenses it to the record label for a period of time. And usually that royalty split is different. Sometimes it's 50-50. Yes. The oh, artist yes. is paying for it themselves. So the traditional record deal is very much about... The traditional record deal is uh, a record company essentially loans an artist money for a few years to live and make records, sometimes pay for their tour called tour support, things like that. And then yeah. they take the lion's share of the royalty on the back end. And the vast majority of those projects do not make money. I mean, that's yeah. like, it's not a really closely guarded secret, but the majority of major label projects do not make money. And the way the yeah. business model works is those 10 or 15 or 20% of artists that do make money make a shitload of money. Yes. So it makes up for all the ones that they bet on. Now that's changing a bit because so many people can build their followings on social media. They can do a lot of the groundwork of artist development before they sign to a label. Yes. So now a lot of label deals, whether you're a big artist, a new artist, whatever, uh, oftentimes it's not a traditional like 15 or 20 points for the artists and the label gets the rest. They give them hundreds of thousands of dollars and then they go figure it out. It's oftentimes yeah. the artist has built a thing. They built the following. They do it. They structure the deal a little bit differently. And I think that's something. Um, so I think all the stuff you said is totally correct. Um, we should also talk about a situation I think a lot of other people are in, which is I'm working with an artist that's an indie artist. Maybe they have a little bit of funding. Maybe they have a little bit of a budget, but they own all their stuff. They're not signed to a major label. Mm -hmm. um, I think the short way to talk about that, the short answer to that sort of stuff is, you know, if you're a producer, you're a part owner in the, the master recording and you can decide what to do from there. If you sign to a, uh, a major label, then you you know, have to get an attorney and do a deal for yeah. the recordings because you're a part owner. If an artist releases it themselves, usually just something like a 50-50 split. If, if I make something with my friend, like if John and I just decide to write a song next week, no label, neither of us are signed, we have publishing deals, but just on the master side, we make a recording, we just own it 50-50 and we decide yep. what to do from there. Now, if yep. he's an artist signed to a big label, then he's got a deal in place then we'll negotiate for the royalty and the fee, and then then he owns it, and I don't own. It. I basically you give up your ownership as a producer or an engineer yeah. uh, for money and royalty, and that yep. just and that changes can change dramatically based on what kind of artist it is. Yes. Um, and so Alexander asked on there, do you take upfront fee as well? Oftentimes, how those things are structured, and I don't know how the mixer deals are structured, but producer deals are roughly you get a fee. And let's say it's, you know, let's say it's 
five thousand dollars or ten thousand says so ten thousand dollars five of that is your fee and you just keep that money and five of it is an advance against future royalties yeah. so the first five thousand dollars you make in royalties you don't get a check for that it goes back to pay half of the money that you were yes. given so that's, that's the referred usual. to as recoupable Rec the recoupable, recoupable amount yeah. Um, so often that is the, the same way a mixer deal is. I have a good lawyer, so I usually get anywhere from twenty-five to fifty percent recoupable. So that's how that's how we we try to structure our deals. But that's yeah, that's how you get paid money up front. And so if I do a production for a major label artist and get paid a bunch of money and nothing ever happens with them, I keep the money. But if yeah. they make if they make money in royalties, my points then go to recoup half of my fee. Exactly. Um, and when you're but when you're working with indie artists, oftentimes it's just there's not a lot of money being thrown around. You just say, Cool, I get fifty percent of the money that you make from this until you then go sell it to a label and then we yeah. renegotiate. The and then deal. we renegotiate. Yeah. Exactly. I've done that a bunch of times. And that's you know, yep. honestly, there's no one way to do that. It's a difficult conversation to have. I've had, you know, I Basically, anytime you get a bunch of artists together and then all of a sudden there's money on the table, inevitably some percentage of those things, people are just going to freak out. And, yeah. and, and it's, it's tough. There's, I've, I've had tough conversations with people about that sort of stuff, and it's, and it's fucked up relationships. I mean, I, there's, yeah. there's no good so, way to say it. It's something tough. that comes to mind about how to talk about money because it's clearly uncomfortable. It's always going to be uncomfortable. I, I think I said it last week. If you have to talk about money, you don't have a manager, do it separately from the creative process. Once the creative process begins, there's no more money conversation. What you agreed for uh, as a fee and a, and a percentage is what it's going to be when the product is delivered, when the project is, uh, is complete, sorry. Don't all of a sudden say, oh, well, it went over the amount of time I thought it was going to take, and now there's more. We agree and we move on. So we don't have to talk about it during the creative uh, process. Now, assess your worth, your time, don't, you don't have to think about it hourly, maybe a day rate, a minimum requirement approximately that you value your time at. I think there's a pretty easy, Spider brought up, there's pretty easy math to do. You like take your total average uh, gross and divide it by, you know, whatever, however many days you want to work throughout the year. And that's about your day rate, right? And be flexible within that parameter and go into it saying, hey, this is what I want and be expected to negotiate. Right? We all have to negotiate and understand why you're negotiating. What are you negotiating for? Does this project have more leverage than another one you're working on? And it, it has more chance of certain success in a genre that you like specifically, not just overall success, because you don't want to get known for doing a kind of music that you don't actually want to do or could replicate again. Like You want to be able to do something that you're comfortable with, that if it does well and people find out you did it, then you can offer that same service to them. Um, I'm in mixed genres. It was a, a decision I made. I, I studied all types of genres and I love, um, I love low end. So I exist in pop and hip hop, but I can also mix country and tame that low end if I need. Like there's, a, there's, there's ways to do that, but you have to know where you want to exist. Um, so I, I think that talking about money is awkward, but it's part of it and learn how to do it. That's, um, that's, that's absolutely true. I think, um, if you're going to be successful in this industry, you got to figure out how to do reps as an entrepreneur. Like you got to learn a little bit about it, even if it's uncomfortable and ultimately you get a manager and a publisher let's actually, and all sort of things. Let's step back and say, uh, not yeah. even this industry, just any freelance. Any freelance. Thing. Someone wants any you to freelance. design their website and, you've, and you're not working for uh, an agency or a firm that does this. You're just doing it on your own. And is it 10K? Is it 50K? Are you managing it? Like, what are the tiers of services you're offering? Like, this is something to, that needs to be understood and written down and decided upon and asking peers, asking people that also do it and getting feedback from what's realistic and doing it confidently, doing it um, from a place of understanding that what you're doing is a service and a product yeah. and you're a work for hire. So, and I'm also creative. So there's got to be the, you know, a little bit of that wiggle room. Sorry and it doesn't. Off, just, no, no, no. It's not only this industry. Yeah, a hundred percent. Any creative industry, and and the world is increasingly moving toward pure entrepreneurs. Um, you know, whether you're making things and selling them on Etsy, or you're a YouTuber, or whatever. Like, there's so much online stuff that you can do uh, in an entrepreneurial way that the world is moving toward that. And th the one thing I, I want to say about that is that you never land on the answer and then you just do things that way. There's, and this is the challenge of it. You're always, even you today, like 
somebody approach you about a project, you still have to do, even though you're John Castelli, you have things a certain way, you've got your fee, you've got your credits, you've got a manager, there's still like a, hey, they want to do this, but maybe it's like this, is it worth our time? You have to weigh all these things of what Every do I day. do? What does my schedule look like? Is this worth it? And whether you're just recording a few local bands and they're like, we have like 400 bucks to pay you for this week. And you're like, is this worth, but you, you know, you're always yeah. going to have to do that. And under like, understanding that you're always going to have to go through some version of that is really, really important. You're going to have to have your entrepreneurial brain available to access. So the more you read about it and the more you practice it, even if it's uncomfortable, know that it's going to allow you to one, make a living and two, do better creative work. And you yeah. talked about one other thing that, that I thought was uh, important, which is you want to have money conversations early. You want to get things settled like off the bat. Now you don't want to go, somebody's like, Hey, I got these great songs. And you go like, all right, here's my fee. Like you don't, you obviously don't want to just go in and be talking about money right off the bat, but you don't want to go really deep into a project without having figured out what the, what people's expectations are. And there's yeah. no right answer for how to do that or when to do yeah, that. Yeah, That's but, a distinction to make between producing and, and mixing. Yeah. I'm not going to engage in a record at this point before knowing the fee. By the way, I, I don't, I don't either. As you know, a, as that's a where I'm at. Yeah, that's I, where I'm I at often now. Don't work until the deal signed, and sometimes yeah. even depending on the label, like un, until the front end check clears. Like I won't touch yeah. files because yeah, I want to be. People, I want to be. People don't want to pay about you. that. Yeah, exactly. So I want to be yeah. pretty transparent about that because this is this conversation needs to uh, dispense itself about around all levels of the industry. Yep. I, I'm sure people are going to watch from. Um, yeah, at some point you got again. We talked about last week. You got to prove yourself. So you got to get in and do things on spec. We talked about spec last week. Uh, this is different than spec. This is at that point where it's time to talk about the money, be knowing that there's going to be money exchanged, not the, because if you agree to do something on spec, then you've agreed to do it on spec, do it, and then you can talk about money later or, if they or like it. I, I often do things on spec with the expectation of, if you use this, I'm getting my yes. full fee and full yes. everything, and here's what it is. And that, that's when you just go, cool, I'm going to do it on spec, but if you use it, you pay full everything. Yeah, I think both apply, again, at different levels. Yep, yep, um, yep. I think at an earlier level, maybe not. Maybe don't even worry about it. Maybe just yeah. do it because someone, some new A&R is trying you out on an artist that you just so happen to fucking love. Yeah. And they've already spent all their, their whatever their $30,000 new deal budget was on one producer for one song. And they got a B-side they want someone to do. And you know that it's going to come out with this single that Max Martin did or whatever it is. Like there's, there's I, like, I did a bunch of those things early on. Yeah, it's like so-and-so did. did all the main singles. And I'm like, cool, you want me to play cleanup? I'll do the deluxe edition thing for like, a couple of grand, but then all of a sudden I have my first major label credit. Like, yeah. You know. So like there's, we got to keep those in the conversation, but yeah, I mean, I wouldn't engage in a project now without having a conversation of what the money is going to be. Cause it's our time. Look, I'm putting my head down this week because I fucking love what I'm working on and I'm stoked about it. Today's mix. The song is beautiful. One of my favorite, um, Swedish artists uh, is, is it's a, it's a duet. It's beautiful and it's ballad. And I can, just can't, I just can't wait to, to, end this and go in uh, but like that doesn't change the fact that i'm not gonna do it unless i know what my time is worth and i'm gonna yeah. get compensated for that time because i can go for a walk it's beautiful outside today and that's worth my time too so it's a different kind of worth and i know that's a pretty like privileged thing to say because some people don't have time to go for walks and they have to be in an office for 10 hours yep. or clean streets or you know whatever but this is my life so in context i have to consider it that way and I've been doing this, like you, same thing, like over 15 years. So like we've paid our dues. So at this point, I really want to have that conversation as early as possible. And I think my point of bringing that up is that's what to strive for. To be yeah. at a place where that conversation is happening early, so it's off the table. I'm not saying that's going to happen right from the beginning, but that's what you want to happen. So at least there's a, there's a trajectory that you can look towards that that's how it, it kind of normally works. Yeah, uh, yeah, and that's how the creative uh, freedom um, is allowed to be in the forefront uh, of the process. And like you said, no matter where you are in the process, you uh, in, the, in the arc of your career, you're going to have to weigh all of the things that one weighs when figuring out if you want to work on something. Everything is an entrepreneurial decision. Everything is case by case. What we've done over the course of years is made mistakes, had successes 
learned, you know, I did a little too much of this. I said yes, or I said no, or I asked for too much money, or I said it at the wrong time. Like you just got to go through those things to learn how to get better at them. But you're, I mean, there are, I imagine people who just cool, I'm just going to charge this much and pay me my money and then I'll make something or I won't based on if you can pay me. But none of us really work like that. We're trying to find new interesting things and we want to work with a new artist who doesn't have enough money to pay a normal yes. rate who's amazing who we believe in you want to do pro bono stuff that you never goes be, away you want to be creative with people and as long as you're in that place which obviously you and i are still there it's you're always weighing what is my time worth how much do i need extra like will extra money help me right now especially when you're early on and things like you got to make a living so yeah there's no there's no straightforward answer. I love like, this conversation raise- i do i really love it because it, there's no real matter of fact answer to any of these yeah. things but this, what, what we're talking about now, and even just what you just said, that's just how it is. Yeah. Like we're, we're passionate about what we do. That hopefully won't go away. I mean, again, it's been 15 plus years for the both of us. Uh, it hasn't gone away. I mean, this year with COVID, there was a few months where I was like, why are we working on music? Like no one's listening to music right now. But that one, that's gone away for me. I'm, I'm like really inspired by some of the, especially things that are coming out of COVID where it's, clearly a bit more on the sad emotive side and more dynamic and and i mean that's kind of like i'm all about hard hitting drums i mean i just did that kid Leroy project that dropped um on friday and yeah it congrats. sounds thank you it, it hits and I, I love i mean i had so much fun doing that yeah. but yesterday and today is like super emotional and like breakups and just you know i've been writing like, a lot of those songs <laughs> and i and i love i love that especially in the cold like i'm all like hoodied up yeah just, yeah you know it's dark upstairs and you know so there's there's that part is not going to go away but we do need to make a living so it's the balance of those two strategy with your manager if you have one if not strategize with peers strategize peers. with your friends peers are really Pe- important people talk that to, are talk to people Talk to people and just gauge their reaction, their gut reaction on something that you say in regards to money and time you've spent and people that you trust, not people that you know do something. Yeah. Like, who's trustworthy? Um, and, so, yeah. and, and the truth is, it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to talk about who's getting paid what, how much should you get paid. But the more you can talk about that with people, um, the more you can be comfortable having a conversation which is inherently uncomfortable you get a Look, better sense of who's charging what and how does it work and you know you'll feel better about your decisions which are always going to be imperfect you're always you're never going to maximize your value you're never going to get all the money especially as an entrepreneur because every time you do something there's the potential to get a little more money or spend a little less time or whatever it is and if you you yeah. know you got to be comfortable going through that process and it's like any investment yeah. it's like any investment hindsight's 2020 20. so like oh if I only did this instead, when when you didn't even have the money, then what do you mean? If you only did it, you didn't even have it. Like you didn't yeah. even have the clout to get you to where you want to be that you are now, because then you didn't have. I mean, look, this is uncomfortable. Like we were saying, it's an uncomfortable conversation. Even talking about this with you to me is semi uncomfortable to a degree because totally. I'm not an expert at it. Yeah, yeah. I'm a fucking totally. kid, and I've made it this far, <laughs> making music somehow, and it's still every day is met with gratitude. Like I'm actually, yeah. I think about, it, I think how lucky I am every day. I sit and I practice meditation, and the one of the main thoughts is, this is lucky. Like yeah. I feel very lucky, yeah. and that part needs to uh, find its way in. Uh, without the words necessarily you don't have to say that to the client but yeah. bring that there bring that compassion there to the project that says i'm actually love this and i would be stoked to work on this here's what i think i need to value my time and then i'm also um malleable to a certain degree at this stage of my career right just that's kind of the overarching thing it's uncomfortable but just be malleable be yeah. negotiable to a certain extent yeah and understand that you're it will never be exactly what you plan it to be. And that's okay. It'll take more time. It'll, it'll, you'll get paid less money, but that's okay. Just keep it moving, make great things. And I, you know, that, that, that's the best advice I think we can give. Hopefully, yeah. hopefully that's some good, good talking about royalties and rates and things. Let's see what, um, what else? Oh, there are a bunch of questions about assistance. When you just, uh, AJ asked, uh, when you decide you needed to hire an assistant, how'd that process work? John asked, how to utilize mm-hmm. assistance. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, 
I've my quick answer on that, and then you can get more into it on the mixer side. My quick answer is when you're, and it's a bit what we talked about last week about adding business people. When you're doing too much stuff that isn't your main task and your main job, when you're spending too much time, basically when you get too busy, when you get when you get too much time spent on things that aren't what you want to be doing, and you can outsource that those tasks. That's when to hire somebody. If you're yep. spending, if you, if you know, if you should be mixing and you're spending too much time running stems and you're doing it a lot, get an assistant. If you're producing and you're spending too much time, I don't know, running around, building your studio, delivering files, interfacing with things, get an assistant. Um, yep. There's part-time assistants, there's studio assistants, there's personal assistants, there's all kinds of ways to do that. But it's the same thing as like, when do you get a business manager? When do you get someone to handle your finances? When you have royalty streams coming from all over the world or you have too many projects or I, for me, it was when I noticed I'd spent three days going through receipts and writing them all down. It's like, okay, what is three days of my time worth? Somebody's professionally going to do this better than me. Yes. I should hand this off to somebody and be and, and try to write a great song and produce a record for those three days instead of literally like writing yeah. on a receipt and filing it. So it's, I think it's a similar thing across the board. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a really good foundational response to that. Um, I, I was told by others that I needed an assistant. Uh, I didn't even know that it was possible to have yeah, an yeah. assistant. That, that's part of it too. Again, another reason to talk to the people around you when you people yeah. that are at your level and you're like, wait, you have two assistants helping you. What do they do? And how does it just ask questions and talk to people? Please. Yeah. Go. Yeah. Go. I think it's, I think of it really specifically uh, just to expand upon what you said, because I would have said everything you just said. And I am getting hired to elevate a piece of music. I'm not getting hired to color code my Pro Tool sessions the way I, I like. No one gives a fuck how yeah. I color code, right? Maybe other engineer geeks could make sense of how I color code and why it makes sense to me and then use that. Sure, that could be valuable information. That's not what I'm talking about. Um, Josh, I, I had uh, Ryan Nashi um, as an assistant. He then went on to engineer for Jeff Basker. Um, just did most recent Portugal, the man with Jeff and he's killing it mixing on his own. Now uh, I got Ingmar Carlson just kind of wrapped up with me um, two years ago and he's on his own mixing now. And Josh de Guzman who's behind me uh, prepping some stuff. So these, these people have been brought in to assist also to mentor, right? So you, you get an assistant because you want to spread and share. Yeah. Uh, Tony Maserati, my mentor came over to a conversations the last, uh, um, was it the last, no, second to last one we had um, an interview and it's, it's online and people might have seen this. And he said, what he said was, none of this will ever be in a book. You guys are the book. Like I'm sharing this with you because there's no way to put these things in a book. You can write anything down. No one can actually see and hear the difference than when you're in the room. So I believe a lot in the mentorship aspect of what the assistant means. Now that's different than a personal assistant or an admin assistant, someone that's yeah. handling receipts and stuff like that or booking you flights like my manager does or something like that that's different but i want the creative environment to be as transparent and direct as possible so when i sit down to touch a mix it should sound as close as possible within reason because other daws clip to the rough mix so i know that i can take it from where it was left off and i can do my my thing my last five to twenty percent depending on what the song needs to elevate and anything in the middle of that takes away from that clear flow state to get there. And if you can't do all of it, because some people can do it. Some people can, maybe they do a day where they prep seven mixes and then they spend the rest of the week mixing those seven. Maybe there's, yeah. a, there's a way that you do that where you do a prep day and like spend all day. There's no creativity. I can't do both. And I can't yeah. do both in the same day for sure. Yeah. So when I realized that I wasn't doing my best work because of that, then I got other people involved and that was spider and tony's advice when i first met the two of them um they were like wait why are you spending so much time doing all this like stem delivery managing the uploads to dropbox uploads to mastering clean versions of the songs these are all things that are so important but when you're in the zone trying to get through like i did five mixes yesterday i didn't deliver five mixes i didn't prep five mixes and do stems for those but josh is now in today delivering one of those songs to mastering because it was approved and like then i can get on uh instagram live with matt rad and yep. i can do that while he's doing that we, we can go back and forth on things so that's just my um a, a little bit of a um intro to the life of me and my assistant that's how i delegate and sometimes he'll do notes if he's around sometimes they'll do notes 
Uh, I like to do all in the notes because I don't believe that notes are exactly what they say most of the time. Um, and I'm a bit of a control freak when it comes to that stuff. But I do allow him to do that sometimes. And as people get more experience, like Tony used to have me do, but he would always check what I did. Like yeah. um, we check each other, but I like I'm a bit of a nut. So I just kind of um, I just do most of that stuff. So. so a lot of the what it sounds like is you've utilized assistance to uh, focus and narrow the process for how you mix. Because yes. when someone, uh, you know, I don't do a lot of straight mixing, but I don't have a full time uh, like engineer or mix assistant. So oftentimes when I get stems, I prep a session for myself and then I do it because I'm mixing a couple of songs and then I'm back to producing right. for a few weeks. But it sounds like, you know, th when people say, Oh, you know, how does, how does someone like John mix like five songs a day? He's not doing any prep. He's not doing any running stems, delivery, any of that stuff. It's you go mm -hmm. into a pro tool session and then you just go, you tweak and do your thing. Yeah. Mix is done. And then you hand it off to somebody to do all the deliveries. So and Josh pairs down like giant sessions to stems that look easy for me. Like I don't want more than 60, tracks in a session yeah yeah absolutely i'm usually at like 24 to 48 you know i don't want that if i need to break that like if someone really wants their string arrangement to be a, a different panning that they have like by a lot then i have to go back into that like i'll ask for that but it's very rare that they yeah. want their string violin group any different than that they had it besides sounding better and fitting better right so um if i need to go that deep i will but it's very rare that that has to happen so. Yeah. And so the, the other side of this question is a lot of people ask, how, how do you choose your assistant? What makes a good assistant? How do you get in? You know, the, the, the big question you get a lot is, how do we get in the door? If, do you need an assistant? How do you? And the, the answer to a lot of that stuff is you're going to just try over and over and over to hit people up and the yeah. timing is going to be there. I mean, I ask people that I think are great engineers if they know another great engineer. That's how I found Josh. Um, I asked a friend of mine that's in town, he, uh, JT, and he's Black's engineer. And when I needed someone to take over for a project when Ingmar was going away for three months at the time, I asked him because I thought he mixing for him as a vocal tracking engineer for the um, Free Black album. I was so inspired and impressed by young engineering yeah. that he had. I was like, yo, who, who do you know? He's like, oh, my homie Josh from Berkeley. It's like, sick, great. And then it just kind of worked out. And he's been here for three years. Um, the next time I'll probably do the same thing. I'll be like, who's making dope shit? cool, let me see. And then, you know, offer someone a position or a trial position. So it's not like, I don't know. I'm not, I'm not kind of into resumes and someone sending me their, their accolades. And the fact that they went to full sale is like not going to sell me if I'm just being honest on, on, yeah. on this, on this show. Um, I get them all the time, like maybe seven times a week. I get an email looking for at least once a day looking for a position. And I'm like, uh, it's COVID. Like, Josh is in my house. This is my house. My studio is in my house in my loft. Yeah, same. Um, so I'm like really picky on who comes over. Um, so there's a lot of criteria. It's different when you're working in a studio and there's runners and there's assistant level. That's a different thing. But for people like us, uh, at which we represent um, a huge portion of the producer and engineer community, which is that they work from home or from a private studio, um, that it's a, a different criteria than if you were just working at Paramount and like, oh yeah, my assistant's coming through. It's a little different. Yeah, it 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 turns out that with so much of this stuff, it it is about the work that you do and people saying good things about you. So it's a, yeah. I think that the great combination. I don't know that I mentioned it last week. This Neil Gaiman speech, mm. but you know, pe people get he said people get hired because they get hired, but people get hired again because they're. You know, they do things on time, they're pleasant to deal with, and the work is great. And he actually says, yeah. you know, you only need two out of the three. Like you can, but, but really, it's like being consistent, doing great work, and having people like what you do and like being around you and like dealing with you and just connecting with more people doing that. And, and ultimately, those opportunities just kind of reveal themselves. There isn't a great way to do yeah. it. And, you know, hustling. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with getting in DMs because, again, it's like, it's like a numbers game when you're trying to ascend. You got to go get yourself out there, put, do a lot of work, have a lot of relationships, stay in touch with a lot of people, get a whole lot of no's, but eventually you'll find a yes and somebody will, you know, somebody will take a chance on you. That's what they did for me. Yeah. Um, but Same. also it was because I did good work and or they liked my work at least. Um, yeah. 
somebody asked about uh, training assistants. That feels like a pretty simple question. You know, a lot what you're talking about and people I'm talking about when I've had assistants and helpers, they're already trained in some way. So they're good at adapting. If you hire a good person, they can learn pretty quickly. So here's my here's my a mixed session that was prepped for me. This is how I want it to be. People yeah. learn pretty quickly. Also, um, I had a pre- prerequisite before I met Josh, my my re- my current assistant. Yeah. Um, uh, with I wanted to only hire people that didn't know how to use Pro Tools. So I when I met Ingmar, he didn't know anything about Pro Tools. Hmm. Um, he was Why? using Ableton because I use Pro Tools. I think differently than a lot of people. Uh, it's like my it's like my video game. I'm so you wanted pretty, to tra- train them in a certain. I wanted way. to train them from 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 the start. Yeah. Um, I, I think I, I don't know if I would do, I'd probably do it again. Yeah. Um, hmm. and he's also, Ingmar is a, a special candidate. I mean, Ingmar is like a, a, a genius human, uh, in his brain, um, coming from two scientists, mother and father. That's just like a different connection where he just, you don't have to say the same thing ever twice. Like it just, Oh, that's it. Cool. I know how to do that. And in fact, I'm going to do it more effectively and efficiently and then show you how I did it. So then you'll know the next time. So, um, I actually like people not knowing Pro Tools. Uh, yeah, and I, I, no audio I school, like no audio school. Like I actually don't know if I would hire someone out of audio school to be real. Yeah, maybe we'll talk about, let's, let's talk about the audio schools and the sort of university training style for audio engineering, for producing. I don't have really strong opinions on this stuff. I know really good people that have gone to Berkeley and come out of that. I know a lot of people have gone to Berkeley for a year yep. or two and then dropped out. Musicians, yep. writers, producers. I don't know as much about the engineering schools, although I get the sense that um, actually making records is way, way, way more important. Um, yeah. But I, I, don't, I don't know enough about those things, about those the schools that, to have a the big The fact opinion. that I wasn't offered hands-on experience on a console till year four of an audio school Below, when consoles were still the, the thing. Did to you do. go to an audio school? For like, uh, I, I showed up to about a month worth of classes in four years, I think. Because hmm. um, I was just like, wait, what am I doing here? I'm, I'm not even, I'm learning about impedance, but like, how am I applying the knowledge of impedance in a microphone if I'm not allowed to do anything? Yeah, yeah. So I actually just showed up to go to the SSL class and learn signal flow, but we weren't allowed to use the console. We just learn signal flow on the strip. It's just like, wait, what? Let me plug in and turn the knob. Like we weren't even allowed to. So I just dropped out. I was like, that's bullshit. Um, which that's probably different now in Berkeley than when I went to school. So uh, please, anybody educate me on when you start using um, the gear uh, when you're in Berkeley. But yeah, I don't, uh, I don't, I don't know that I would discourage someone or say that if you went there, there's something bad. But I would say that having a better, a, sorry, yeah, having a structured having a structured training program for engineering will divorce you from the thing we were talking about earlier, which is you need to be a self-motivating entrepreneur to succeed in this industry. And if you don't learn that skill, which is on some level specifically the opposite of having scheduled classes. And I, you know, I don't know how the yeah. audio schools work, but it's like you have to show up at this time and then you have this test and all kinds of stuff. The real world it, it would be one thing if you're going into a consulting company, you're going to go be an attorney or you're going to go work in a, some corporate structure or something that has a structure built into it, an infrastructure for you're going to ascend in this way and you're going to show up at this time. Engineering, producing, these sorts Look. of things are so much about you have to get up out of bed and do some entrepreneurial creative shit every day and no one's going to, no one's going to go like, hey, it's time to show up. Like, no. You really got to go. I, mean, I, I just, I think that the, the, the price that you spend, let's just say on one semester for one semester's worth of high end audio school, you can get a set of monitors that are great, an interface, a computer, and I a forgot, microphone. I didn't even think about the cost of it. Yeah. The cost of it. And oh then you God, have yeah. YouTube, you have YouTube and then bang on doors of studios to get real time experience on their console or learning signal flow on YouTube and in an internship position, if you can get one. Most of the people that I know that I work with that I'm inspired by sonically that produce and that I'm mixing for did not go to audio school. They learned online. They learned by doing, and they're sonically so much more advanced than a lot of people I know that went to audio school that are actually talented. I'm not saying these people aren't talented and 
and and but they have more taste they have more attitude um and more more interesting um uh, uh perspective on what you can do with sound than like oh man that record sounds so good it's like okay like does it feel like something or does it sound good you know one one thing i would add to that and again i i don't i, I don't want to like bash audio school because i don't know much about it but i would also guess that i know this a little bit from people I know that went to med school and other things where technology is advancing quickly and research is advancing quickly. If you learn something this year and that's the way to do it in two years, it's going to be different. I mean, it's yeah. important to learn signal flow, check out our, uh, our episode on gain staging. I mean, there's, yeah. there's, there's good resources for, for there's learning foundations this stuff online. and fundamentals that you need to know. And so I, I think that, that getting out there and making records is going to be more important than anything else. Just and also and, like and, now mixed by Ali and Alex Tume and these, and, and Josh Goodwin, they're going on Twitch and live mixing, like watch them live mix. Yeah. yeah. You know, check out their most recent successful mixes that you think sound good and then go watch them make something like that's so tight. I don't know if I'm going to do that just because the, I'm a little bit lazy. Uh, I think that's a great resource, but I'm just going to point in the direction of them. You should watch Ali mix because Ali is great. You know, I don't know. I've thought about it. I'm like, ah, I don't know. I mix, like the, I mix so fast. I don't even know if people would be able to see what I was doing slash care what I was doing. Well, there's a, there's a couple things that are on the horizon that you and I might work on together. Maybe we can talk the artist into letting us do like a live where mm. we talk about the record and talk That's about cool. what I did and then talk about what you did. Um, that could be there's fun. A, there's a few projects without naming them now, but you, you and I have talked at least about one of them, maybe two of them offline. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, that would, yeah. But there's, cool. That'd be cool. But, but that, that might be a cool thing to do. Yeah. I mean, there's just, there's just so many resources. Uh, I know. And there's so many resources for, for, for learning how to make records, saving the money. I just didn't even think about how much money it probably costs. So yeah. Oh my yeah. God. Are you kidding me? At least 40 grand a year. That seems insane. So like one semester, you got speakers and a computer and a microphone and an interface. Like, sorry, four, guys. Like four semesters, just buy a house, buy a studio. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. That's, that's but, 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 but seriously, ser what, yeah. I actually genuinely like, there's very few pieces of advice I'd like to give because I don't like, I don't want to prescribe things to humans. But instead of doing that early business loan, instead of a student loan to get a, a, a very good basic setup is more valuable to your ears and experience yeah totally agree there there it's uh, been said <laughs> there it's been said <laughs> um all right well let's see there you go like uh eight, five eight minutes oh my left. god i love this mike this miller's is twitch stream josh prepping <laughs> <laughs> there were That's a lot hilarious. of questions there were a lot of questions about prepping mixes, delivering stems. How do you do? And I don't know a good way to answer that uh, by just like listing how to do things. So, I, are there resources for that? Do people talk about? I mean, uh, I think everybody knows. Everyone this, has their know. own way. Every <clears throat> every artist wants it a certain way to a degree if they're doing live. But we have a pretty standard way where we give every instrument separate. Yeah. Um, for basic fast stems, it might be like all drums, bass guitars, keyboards. This is when you're delivering stems. When I'm delivering, it's all individual. Yeah. And it's bounced through my analog mix chain um, one by one with the effects attached or separate, depending on how they're asked for. We do it attached by default. Um, and then, uh, except for vocals, then we'll do vocals separate and then an existing acapella. Yeah. Um, so instrumental, acapella, TV track, which is no lead or lead down, depending yeah. on what the artist wants. But we go back and forth on stems with labels and artists depending on the utility of them. So even years down the line, they're going to do a remake of a song with, and they'll need a different separation. This is just kind of, you, you do it. It's like you don't know how to handle a budget until you have a budget. You learn to handle a budget. You don't know how to do stems until you have to do stems. Yeah. Uh, all the more reason to just do as much as possible. But so stems, uh, stems, I guess, by definition, would be uh, instrument groups together versus stripes which versus would be every instrument separate versus multi-track. Yeah. For, yeah. That, yeah. The, the, the stripes would be committed multi-tracks. Like the snare is committed. I've never heard stripes before. It makes sense. Yeah. 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 Give me stripes means just give me everything individual, but committed with all your shit. Everything, on. everything printed, every individual track printed. Yeah. No plugins. I don't want your plugins. Uh, I don't want your plugins. I don't want um, your plugins. I don't want your waves bundle. Like get rid of the waves. Bundle. I'm going to, I'm going to put so many waves on the songs. I send you. <laughs> Um, <laughs> let's see. There's so many other questions. Um, 
Yo, stoked that we probably will work together on. We've never worked together before. We've never, we never properly. We've, we've worked think, on the same project on different songs. We've, yeah, we've yeah, never actually. I think we're about to work together on two things. There's potential, you know. You never want to, never want to count yeah. chickens. Yeah, yeah. Our, 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 our vocals on everything. Um, let's see. Um, well, you really flipped my mood upside down. I feel better uh, doing this today. Just so you know. I feel like there aren't any other really quick little questions. I feel like we kind of covered the other bases of of the business questions. So maybe we just call it here. Yeah. Um, if you guys have other specific business questions, um, hit me up. I'm going to answer a bunch of the questions. There are more some some more specific things about pub deals and other things. Um, so I'll hit some other people up in DMs. Um, but thank you guys for hanging out and watching all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, we'll see you next week. Uh, we'll have the audio and the YouTube up next week. So the po- uh, tomorrow, I should say, the audio will be up on the podcast version, and uh, and we'll be back next week. Sick. Thank you guys so much. Love you, John. Love you. Cheers. Peace, guys.